everyone. My name is Victor Cha. I'm the Senior Advisor and Career Chair here at CSIS. And I'm happy to be here with uh, Rory Metcalf, who is the Director of the International Security Program at the Lowy Institute in Australia. Uh, our discussion today, conversation, is on North Korea and the way forward. And I guess I'd like to begin the conversation, Rory, by asking you, um, uh, there have been a whole set of sanctions that have been placed on North Korea as a result of their three nuclear tests and their numerous ballistic missile tests. In your opinion, do, the, or do these things work? Are these sanctions working, or is there anything else that the UN or the Security Council should be doing? Uh, good to be with you, Victor, and um, welcome, uh, welcome to the Lowy Institute uh, in, a, in a virtual way. Look, I think um, we have no choice but to continue with the sanctions path, but it's hardly the only instrument that the international community should be using. Uh, it's quite striking that every time there's uh, an act of provocation by North Korea, whether it's a nuclear test or whether it's a missile launch or whatever it may be, there's a call for a new round of sanctions and there always seems to be some small degree of tightening that can be done. But this does not appear, in my view, to be the fundamental driver of regime behaviour in response to the international community. I think uh, there's also a role for deterrence and ultimately without, uh, in my view, a much uh, stronger sense of continuous Chinese pressure, uh, all of these interesting, useful, small sanctions are not going to fundamentally uh, change the regime's behaviour. Even if we were to deny them all their luxury goods, for example, I still think they'd put uh, regime survival and stability uh, and, and their own continued power um, ahead of um, those material benefits. But yeah, I, I think I would have to agree I, I, with you. What's on, your sense? On you've, you've been much closer to the action uh, when it comes to North Korea than I have. Well, I would agree with you. I think that uh, the sanctions are a necessary thing that the UN must respond to every time the North Koreans do these tests. And I think there's there's the hope that uh, while they won't denuclearize North Korea, they will have some sort of impact on proliferation financing or the development of these programs. But they are only part of uh, the larger policy, I think, with regard to North Korea. The other aspect, of course, is deterrence. And here I think uh, the United States has been working very hard at trying to deter North Korea from uh, undertaking more provocations under this young uh, new leadership. Uh, this most recent effort in the spring of um, flying B-2s and B-52s as part of exercises out there, I think were an attempt really to draw a red line uh, for the North Korean leadership, this young North Korean leader, in case he didn't know where the red line was. I think this was a real effort to show them, um, here, we'll show you where the red line is if you have trouble finding, figuring out um, where that was. And I think it was somewhat effective in terms of getting uh, the North Koreans to quiet down a little bit. Of course, there were other factors, but I th certainly think that was one of them. Um, Rory, could you tell me what you think sort of Australia's response to this, their role in it? I know that they've also been a strong advocate of sanctions and have been a supporter, um, at least when I was in government, of the six-party process um, uh, from the outside. What's sort of the reaction there, uh, in your view, among, among experts to the problem? Uh, look, Victor, I think the, the Australian position is, is, is pretty clear, not only because Australia is a US ally, but because really our security and our prosperity is hugely enmeshed with what happens in North Asia. Australia has a very deep interest in helping to manage uh, the North Korea situation. And I say manage rather than resolve because I'm fairly, fairly pessimistic about, about prospects there. So Australia, including using its uh, non-permanent seat on the UN Security Council, uh, has really been not only a strong supporter, but has tried to, uh, I think, lead the charge with, uh, with tightened sanctions. Australia, interestingly, and I'm not sure I agree with this, but Australia has been reluctant to um, uh, allow North Korea to re-establish its, uh, its embassy in Canberra. We renewed diplomatic relations back in, I think, around 2000. Uh, but recently, uh, the North Koreans have not been able to bring in a new ambassador. I think that's a very tiny um, gesture by Australia. I'm not sure it's the most productive gesture we could make. More substantially, though, Australia's uh, a serious player in the proliferation security initiative. Uh, I think that uh, when it comes to any kind of uh, maritime, dare I say, enforcement of sanctions, um, Australia would be there. But 
there are no illusions in this country that um, as a middle player of 23, 23 million people, uh, we can't make a fundamental difference. We can help uh, really try and add our voice to the international community on this issue. But Australia is watching closely, and I want to go back to your point about extended deterrence, if I may. Australia is watching closely how that has played out this year, because one of the, the key questions for many US allies and partners in Asia at the moment is what is the future of extended deterrence under the rebalance, under new circumstances where perhaps the US-China relationship is going to be more competitive than it was. And I'm really interested in your assessment that the, um, the playbook of deterrence gestures, the, the B2 uh, flight uh, and so forth back in um, uh, March, April, that this worked um, and that this wasn't in fact uh, running the risk of further provocation of North Korea. Uh, what's your sense of the, the response of other allies, Japan, South Korea, to that activity? And do you think there was a moment there where, where the US did have to recalibrate uh, its responses? Um, well, I think, Rory, you know, I think that um, the actions that were taken part of regular annual US military exercises, um, and I think the response both in Japan and, and South Korea uh, was a positive one. I don't think there were feelings that this was unnecessarily escalatory. Um, North Korean rhetoric and actions were cl clearly beyond the pale, beyond anything we've seen before. And, uh, you know, I think uh, the United States felt that it, 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 it needed to respond in a way that would show uh, the North Koreans uh, where the red line was and show allies in the region that the United States was not going to take this sort of sitting, sitting down. And so my understanding, at least from folks I've talked to, both in South Korea and in Japan, is that they generally saw this as a positive, uh, a, a positive thing. It doesn't, of, it doesn't, of course, remove the risk that North Korea could still carry out some sort of provocation, um, because I still think that's on the table. I think that is still a possibility. Our own research here at CSIS has shown that there uh, these uh, inter-Korean uh, dialogue that started in June, um, these sorts of things don't stop uh, provocations by the North. And South Korean elections, new presidents often generate provocations by the North. So I don't think we're out of the woods on that. Um, and I, but at the same time, I think the United States has tried to keep a very close uh, um, uh, handle on maintaining a strong deterrent posture in support of its allies in the region. Um, Rory, I guess the last topic we might discuss is China and um, uh, what we think China's role in all of this is or what role they could play in some sort of solution. I tend to be as skeptical as you about whether we can actually find a solution and whether we're just managing the problem. Where, where do, what do you think uh, China's role in all of this is or should be? Well, I guess I take the view that there must be a, I guess, uh, a playbook, if you like, of, of measures that China can take. Uh, to put pressure on North Korea. I don't take the view that any increase in Chinese pressure uh, sets us on an automatic path to regime destabilisation or collapse, which seems to me to have been sometimes the excuse used within the Chinese system not to do more. So I, I get the sense that we still have an opportunity here and that certainly it's been welcome to see uh, really Chinese outrage, uh, at least uh, at, a, at an emotional level, about North Korea's uh, provocations and indifference this year. Um, the big question is where to from here? I was slightly heartened by my sense that the, the summit um, in early June in um, Sunny Lands, the, uh, the Obama Xi Jinping summit, um, seems to have raised the conversation about what to do about North Korea. Um, I've even heard, I guess, um, hints that the discussion moved towards uh, what would China and the US do in the event of a crisis, uh, not quite contingency planning, but moving there. So I think we have an opportunity, um, but I also, I also think that there needs to be a fundamental shift within the Chinese debate. There certainly are still voices, uh, serious voices in China, that, um, that take the view that uh, no amount of um, risk or pressure on North Korea is worth it from a Chinese, uh, from a Chinese point of view. Uh, so I'm, again, I'm not optimistic, but uh, we've got the best opportunity we've had in years, I would have thought. Well, what's your perspective on that? Um, I'm not too far off from that. I mean, I think, um, 
You know, all of our cooperation with China thus far on North Korea has been short-term, tactical, and pretty superficial. And uh, I agree with you. I think, you know, using Sunnylands, using Park Geun-hye's visit to China, we need to move to the next level with China, which is a quality of cooperation that is more long-term and more strategic and more genuine. Um, and, I mean, that's a tall order for all the reasons that you stated and all of China's perceived equities in North Korea. Uh, but I think that's a conversation that we need to shift towards. And hopefully the leadership in both uh, here in the United States as well as in South Korea, as well as in China through these various meetings are trying to get to that point. Yeah, for as long as, as, long as things can't be reined in on the Korean Peninsula, I get the impression that um, the rebalance to Asia is not all about China. So I would have thought it's in China's interests uh, to really change that situation. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, uh, well, thanks a lot, Rory. This was a great discussion, and I'm sure that we'll continue these into the future. Um, and so thanks for uh, being on the line, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Sadly, I'm sure we'll all be speaking about this again. That's right. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. <laughs>